Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Claims about man-made threats to the earth from climate change must rank among the biggest hoaxes ever perpetrated by anyone, anywhere. Even worse are the so-called solutions being imposed to achieve, quote, net zero carbon emissions, like an eliminating hydrocarbons and mandating wind and solar power, which essentially shut down a modern economy that has lifted billions of people out of poverty. What's happening now is not about the climate. It's not about energy. It's not about the environment. Instead, an unscientific and purposeful climate scare is being perpetrated by a new class of power elites to impose their will and right to rule over the rest of us. Well, I know these are strong statements, but the more you dig into the faux science and the unstated agenda of the climate change regime, the more they ring true. If we care about freedom, and human flourishing, we need to speak out with the truth about climate. One great place to start is by absorbing the facts in the recently public book by my recently re recently published book by my guest on this episode, Dr. Jerome Corsi, titled The Truth About Energy, Global Warming, and Climate Change, Exposing Climate Lies in an Age of Disinformation. It's a tour de force that establishes the case with carefully reasoned, well-researched, and fact-based arguments. Dr. Jerome Corsi received a PhD from Harvard University and has published over 25, 25 books on economics, history, and politics, including six New York Times bestsellers, two at number one, Unfit for Command and The Obama Nation. So Jerry, welcome. Bill, great to be with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, great to see you. Well, let's start, let's start with this. Uh, I want to get at the heart of the matter. You write the uh, the whole climate hysteria seems to focus on a a molecule, carbon dioxide CO two, which we humans exhale exhale and which we release into the atmosphere by burning fossil fossil fuels. So, Jerry, what's the truth about CO two? Well, I think first of all, CO two is not a noxious chemical. Obviously, we exhale it, it doesn't kill us. It's part of a natural carbon cycle. Uh, the What the argument is, is with burning hydrocarbon fuels since the Industrial Revolution, we've caused the planet to dramatically heat up in a way that historically has not been the case. That's the argument. Now, the, there's several fallacies in this argument. Um, first of all, there have been there much more carbon dioxide in earlier Earth periods. Uh, we take the Earth being about 4.6 billion years old, and I know that's not the biblical view, but it's certainly the scientific view. You've got a um, very, very hot Earth in the beginning of time that had a lot of sulfur dioxide and, and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It was basically a non-inhabitable planet. For 80% of the time Earth has been in existence up until the pre-Cambrian period, there was no life on the surface of the planet. And so it was not an inhabitable planet. Uh, in fact, the changes in Earth have been dramatic so that in uh, maybe 100 million years ago, we had much more carbon dioxide than we do today. We've had ice ages with more carbon dioxide. Today, carbon dioxide is a trace molecule it's only 0.0004%. That's four one thousandths of 1% in the atmosphere. That's all the carbon dioxide there is. Its impact as a greenhouse gas is not measurable. It's so small. The argument is that um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas because we're emitting it that holds the heat in Earth and it warms up the planet. But as I said, first of all, um, these greenhouse gases are essential for life on the planet. Otherwise, at night, all the irradiance from the sun would escape back into the um, atmosphere and would be too cold to inhabit. And secondly, 
water vapor is 70% of all greenhouse gases, much more important than carbon dioxide. Yet the left doesn't demonize water vapor, it demonizes carbon dioxide because that's what we use in, in, in industrial activity, burning hydrocarbon fuels. So that's why it's picked as the villain. Well, you, 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 you point out in the book, and it's so true, there's so many distorted statistics and numbers that are thrown out to scare people. I think one of the things you mentioned is that the scary reports are we're now putting 80 billion cubic whatevers of, of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. Well, you need a little context for that. Evidently, the, the atmosphere is how many trillions uh, of, of, of cubic yards uh, large. So it turns yeah. out to be, as you point out, 0.001 percent yeah. um, so that 80 billion is not exactly uh it's not even it's not even a drop in the bucket it's not even a drop in the ocean <laughs> but it's, it's it, it sounds like a big number so it scares people and again a lot of the science is uh the you know international the intergovernmental the ipcc intergovernmental panel on climate change which is the u.n organization responsible for a lot of this climate hysteria has um, perpetrated a very distorted view of the science, which I think legitimate climate scientists reject. Uh, the idea that you know we have, for instance, as I said today, we are in an interglacial warming period, and carbon dioxide is actually very positive because it's what plants absorb. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, warmer, it makes, it makes a greener planet. It actually allows life to thrive. You know, the reason we have now six or more billion people on the earth is because uh, the earth is not only warmer, but it has more plant life. And uh, with burning hydrocarbon fuels, which are cheap energy compared to other alternatives, uh, we have the ability to produce enough food and have enough of a industrial society to support this level of population has never been possible in the history of the world until now. We should be very pleased about this. Well, how did, how did carbon dioxide get singled out as the, uh, as the terrible thing it's supposed to be? And, and when did the, the, the IPCC get, get stood up? You say it's part of the United Nations. When, when did this all arrive at our doorstep? The IPCC goes back about maybe 20, 30 years. I mean, it's been a recent phenomenon. Uh, the, I, the first three chapters of the book, I outline how this uh, hysteria developed. After World War II, uh, uh, several writers, including um, William uh, Harrison Brown, I'm sorry, Harrison Brown, let's start with him, who was a nuclear scientist. He participated in the Manhattan Project, started writing books about there's too many people. We're going to use up the natural resources of Earth, and people are going to starve and die, so we have to have fewer people, and we have to use fewer natural resources. Well, that was a Malthusian idea. Malthus is famous for the mathematics that population is going to exceed food and people are eventually going to starve and you can't produce enough food to keep the populations going. Uh, that idea was advanced by um, people like uh, 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 the population bomb. You know, we had uh, the whole... Was, was that Paul Ehrlich? Or was Paul, that... Ehrlich Paul Ehrlich and his wife. Yeah. Was, yeah, Paul yeah. Eric, the Population Bomb in 1968 was a very, very big book and a bestseller. And it again, advanced this too many people idea. You've got to kill people. I mean, uh, Harrison Brown actually wanted there to be government control. He wanted there to be worldwide control of population, only allowed to have certain number of children. He wanted to eliminate the mentally deficient. And um, Paul Ehrlich advanced that argument, made it popular in the 60s. And then he got joined by John Holdren. John Holdren was ultimately the science czar for Obama. And he had a background in science, but they two met at the university out in California where, um, uh, where Ehrlich was teaching. Ehrlich's specialty was butterflies. He had studied butterflies. That's how he got his PhD. He had nothing to do with the climate or population. He also, Ehrlich never said there were too many butterflies. I never read it. <laughs> but at any rate, Ehrlich... Um, when he joined with Holdren, Holdren said, well, look, if, if there's too many people, we got to find a reason why people will have an existential fear. And he said in terms of the climate, because hydrocarbon fuels exude carbon dioxide, 
it is going to cause an imbalance in the Earth's temperature. At first, they thought it was going to cause an ice age. That was the initial fear in the 70s. We're going to have a new ice age and kill everyone. Uh, the planet actually started warming up in another little brief period. It was only cold, and then it was warming. These changes occur all the time in time series analysis. At any rate, uh, so they switched it to being global warming. And <laughs> Holdren started advancing this argument. So the environmental movement it coming out of World War II, which is basically, you know, that it, let's be good stewards of the planet, which is a responsible idea. Once it got it hijacked by the depopulationists, the Malthusians, and then it got further hijacked by the radical environmentalists who want there to be less hydrocarbon, act less industrial activity on the earth. And <clears throat> finally, it got co-opted by the Marxists. So by the time you get to AOC, you know, Alexandria Cortez, I mean, Ocasio Cortez in Congress and others, they now advance that in fact, it is capitalism and the burning of hydrocarbon fuels that releases this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And they believe the carbon dioxide is, um, is fossil fuel. So we're releasing carbon that was trapped in these dead organisms into the atmosphere. And it compounds because it's building every year, releasing more. And so it's additive. And if we raise the temperature of the earth a few degrees, we're going to actually have global warming catastrophes. So, so this, is, this has all gotten very mystical and very otherworldly because there aren't they also saying thing like burning? We're not only disrespecting the earth and species now, but we're disrespecting all those poor dinosaurs that yeah. uh, died and were compounded into into whatever they were, and the, that's what they call fossil fuels. And and you point out in the book that we're not talking about fossil fuels. We're we're talking about hydrocarbon, which is, uh, you know, we can talk about the chemistry of that, and I hope you will. But just one other point: it seems like all these things you're talking about, Ehrlich, the Malthusian, the the people, the the, the Club of Rome, you know, the limits to growth, the whole group of people are totalitarian, top-down, they're anti-human, they're anti-flourishing, and most importantly, they're anti-innovation, and they don't believe that uh, that humans have been creating much that's worthwhile for the time we've been on the earth, and particularly, they don't buy into the fact that uh, the um, Industrial Revolution, which was powered, they call it capitalism, that was Marx's term, it was really free market economics, voluntary exchange, people innovating, and um, and building a better world, they don't believe in that. And so all these groups have coalesced into a, a coalition. I guess I'm doubling my terms here, but uh, so and and it's not just about climate; it's now about uh, um, transgender. <laughs> well, that's correct. Well, that's where it's gone. I mean, it's all got, it's, it's all it's all one. It's one, ideologically one driven. It's ideologically yeah. driven. I mean, not science driven. Not science. But, but can I circle back here though? How did yeah. that lonely little molecule, the CO2 molecule, get singled out as the demon? Because if you pointed out it's a trace element, I think you say in the book it yeah. could go up three or four or five times and it still yeah. wouldn't show up in the um, in, in in the measurements. And we've had ice ages when there's been, you know, a hundred or a thousand times more carbon dioxide as concentration in the atmosphere. So it is not a driver of Earth's temperature. It is not a major factor in Earth's temperature. Water vapor plays a much more significant role. But the point is, the, uh, the especially with Ehrlich and Holdren, they had to find something that created an existential threat. In other words, we're all going to die <laughs> unless we do what we what I say. Okay, what I'm saying, what the argument is, we got to stop using industrial activity. We cannot use, we can't burn hydrocarbon fuels because they emit carbon dioxide. Now, I mean, it, it carbon dioxide, as I said, is plant food. It's a, it's a one of the key molecules that permits life on Earth. We exhale it. <clears throat> Given that this was a Malthusian movement, it's almost suicidal. You know, we're the cause of our own extinction. We're the cause of what they're saying is going to be a sixth extinction. Human beings are the problem. We're the, we're the, you know, the, the malice. We're the the nemesis on earth we destroy ourselves and of course we have to take cows with us and anything else that emits methane and uh they don't want 
They want basically a reduction back to a much smaller population without industrial activity. And they, they want to be in control. And so, you know, this is the whole movement for renewable energy, et cetera, comes out of this, this, this motive to be in control. I don't think this is commonly understood at all. I think there's a, you know, even Republicans that should know better. Of course, I, I have to revise that after the $1.7 trillion but, uh, omnibus bill they just voted for. Um, we should know better. I mean, it's it's not a, uh, uh, you know, this is not, this has never been about climate, yet everybody wants to feel good. They want to be nice to the climate. They like animals. They like plants. And so being green has been put into this, uh, you know, virtuous category when in fact the agenda is quite, uh, quite draconian, quite ominous. Well, there's nothing green about wind. What's green about wind energy? What's green about solar energy? As far as I can see, the sun is yellow. There's nothing green. <laughs> well, and, well, uh, but even further, it's not re it's not really renewable and it's not really sustainable. I mean, the, the the amount of mining that needs to go in to make the equipment or the materials that make a battery batteries. or a, or a wind farm or a, or a solar field um, is astronomical. It's much more energy intense than uh, than hydrocarbons. As I point out, and also I read a chapter on Solyndra, which was the boondoggle in the Obama administration. Great Obama chapter. I, I had some friends that worked in that administration on Solyndra. Yeah, so. I'm sure you did. It was and a they, tough career move for them. <laughs> they all decided that it was going to, you know, they were going to put the money under Obama. They put billions of dollars into wind and solar. And of course, uh, Peter Schweitzer, who you know, I greatly <clears throat> admire with his Government Accountability Institute there in Washington, demonstrated that about three quarters of the money that went under the Obama various stimuluses to green energy went to uh, people who were on his finance committee in 2008. Yeah. Now, the projects all failed. Uh, we, you know, the wind farms and, and solar panels out there in the desert that nobody's using at all, they're junk. And uh, no one was put to jail and the money was gone, billions spent. And much of that equipment is obsolete today and useless because it doesn't well, work. It doesn't well, sufficiently it power what we need with enough energy to, to propel a major city or a major population area. Well, I, I like what you wrote about when you're praising Mark Morano, who he who should be praised, has been a pioneer in this field for decades. But he's, I guess, you one of the things you say you write is that when the government mandates and subsidies run out, the fields of rotting wind turbines and rusting <laughs> solar panels will be a monument to the folly of decarbonization. <laughs> I mean, it's exactly well correct. said well said <laughs> well i mean look if we had a solar battery the size of a flashlight battery yeah. that would power a city you wouldn't need subsidies that would be produced by private industry immediately and everybody would switch to it the fact is that hydrocarbon fuels are combustible and so their energy coefficient if you look at the physics hydrocarbon fuels it's a very high energy coefficient Whereas wind and solar have to be stored. You know, they're yeah. generating electricity and that they're not used as they come offline. They have to be stored. And the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So you have to have backup hydrocarbon systems. And the, the problem is that the storage also loses energy as extremely costly and also uses a lot of rare material materials like lithium and at least electric vehicles. So it's a very inefficient energy technology. You know, you'd have to have huge areas of the earth devoted to wind and solar. And even then, the, the logistics of transmitting that energy over long distances and storing it is not easy. It's very expensive. Well, yeah, my friend, I think you know him as well, Mark Mills at Manhattan Institute, yeah. written, written extensively on this. And he yeah. points out that to replace uh, hydrocarbons in, in, in the United States, you'd need, with wind and solar, you'd need uh, wind and solar fields that would cover half the surface area of the continent. Uh, it just, it, it's, it's a stunningly in, in, terrible use of, uh, of, uh, of the environment, if, if you will. <laughs> Not to think, think of all the birds that the, that the windmills oh. are gonna kill. <laughs> they do constantly. And, and look, 
the core of my book really after the first few chapters where I explain this politics is ideological. We're dealing with an ideological agenda. Well, let, let's let's give a quick plug for the book. You're this is the Bill Walton show. I'm here with the great Dr. Jerome Corsi, who's written a book. And if you'll hold it up so we can make sure we get it on TV, the truth about energy. Uh, global warming and climate change yeah, and yeah. it it's a sometimes fabulous there, sometimes the, the you know the exposing climate lies in an age of disinformation and it does we're... and it does and i'd highly recommend it it's a you need to you need to have a cup of coffee for some of the chapters before you start in reading because it gets into the actual science and the real truth behind uh what's going on with the climate and if you want to if you want to win arguments with your friends at the club or wherever you're into it, this is the place to start because it's got uh, it's got all the real science that uh, that you, that you'll need. So, Jerry, continue. Well, I mean, there's so many uh, the this movement exists because there. First of all, people are not well educated in science any longer. People are not versed in math. They don't have excellent. They don't have backgrounds in chemistry or physics, and a lot of lies have been told. The disinformation about energy uh, over the years is is an, is enormous um i start out with one of the key ideas of saying that you know um oil coal and natural gas are not fossil fuels they're hydrocarbons hydrocarbons are chemicals you know so there's not and even this distinction goes back into a fundamental i think misunderstanding that traces back centuries in chemistry to where there's organic and inorganic chemistry and carbon related issues going to go into organic chemistry a lot of our bodies are carbon hydrocarbons are assumed to come from organic material those were supposed to be the living chemicals well there's no such thing as living and dead chemicals there's just chemicals chemicals so the, so the distinction between organic and inorganic is a false one false one because we you know basically chemistry is about atomic structures and how atomic structures either as elements form or when the elements combine elements come together to form molecules what that process is like to form molecular structures so carbon dioxide is carbon atoms and oxygen atoms which are combined to do a carbon dioxide as a molecule okay and that has a unique structure now the question that was raised in chemistry and it's been raised very brilliantly by a group of german chemists between world war one and world war ii was that how is oil synthesized in other words it was a chemical structure there has to be a way the it's put together and the idea that it was decomposing organic material to anyone who's really versed in science in terms of the second law of thermodynamics and this is why, Bill, it takes a little bit of study to be able to understand this. But if you don't get these concepts, you're going to be easily fooled by the rhetoric of the left because you don't, you can't argue with it. You can't see through it. But the point is that carbon dioxide as a chemical structure can the, the Weimar Republic chemists said, we're going to figure out how to synthesize it, how Earth makes this stuff. But what they decided was Germany had a lot of coal but did not have much oil. Now, if they were going to fight World War II, the Weimar Republic chemists were charged and assigned to figure out how to produce synthetic oil, diesel fuel, aviation fuel to run the Wehrmacht, the world, you know, the army that was going to fight World War II for the Germans. So they came up with these equations. They actually synthesized hydrocarbons, and they realized that if you take something that's got carbon in it and something that's got hydrogen in it, and you've got intense pressure and heat with the presence of a catalyst, which is often what's needed to make these atomic joinings into molecules. They don't just join together. I mean, hydrogen and carbon, you know, want to get together. But, <laughs> but to get together, they're going to need a catalyst that gets, you know, they need a matchmaker. And they need the right temperature. They need the right heat in order to bind. You know, I knew this show was going to be sexy. <laughs> well, that's what it is. it's all about the prairie process or all these chemicals. But, but I want to interject here. The Germans tried to create something that would make gasoline ultimately from from the hydrocarbons, but turned out to be very expensive. And if you if you look at 
what happened to Germany, and most people don't know this, they fought the war with totally insufficient um, uh, you know, hydrocarbon, gasoline resources. Lots of, look at all the photos, and there are lots of horse and carriages still in the German army in World War II. Well, in fact, Germany created Fischer Tropp's plants all around Germany. That's what the, that's what the they did. process is that breaks Fischer Tropp. Okay. Fischer, the Fischer, these were two chemists, yeah. F I C H E R and T R O P S C H. These two chemists created a process, the Fischer Tropp's process where they basically were able to gasify coal. They were to produce it into a, a vaporized form. Pressure and heat, they could take carbon and hydrogen and form hydrocarbon chains. Now that's a little technical, but I mean, I do describe it in the book because the Germans realized they could produce everything from methane to propane to it, the fuels that were needed to produce aviation fuel, fuel, diesel fuel, and car. Now, 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 now would that technology be commercially viable today? Or was it well, we actually, in World War, at the end of World War II, Army intelligence went to Germany and got the Fischer Tropsch equations. Yeah. And I found them on the microfilm in the National Archives out in Silver Spring. It took me quite a while to find them, but I have now a file of all the Fischer Tropsch materials and I understand the chemistry. Uh, they work, and we after World War II, we did build at least one fish, Fisher Trops plant in the United States. China, by the way, is still operating Fisher Trops plants. Hmm. It doesn't care how expensive they are. We operated if one or two, and we decided they were too expensive given how relatively cheap oil and natural gas were. Now, of Let course, me... they our our petrochemists said we're going to run out of gasoline because it's, you know there are only so many dinosaurs. There's only so much fossil fuel but we never have run out of it that's another point i want to get to and i do elaborate on that in the book well let me get to the point that i want to understand which is burning hydrocarbons gasoline coal um, natural gas whatever admits something into the atmosphere i guess co2 yes among other things but co2 is the one they care about but there's no link as you've pointed out in the book between the co2 levels and the earth's temperature the the link is so minimal i mean carbon dioxide would define minimal is it like one well, percent word, ten what do we what do we know what do we know because we're reorganizing an entire western civilization based on uh, this belief and it's a belief that if, if it's this wrong we need to get it out there and correct the record because we're making lousy decisions right now based on this this fallacy the water vapor is 70% of all the greenhouse gas effect on Earth. Water vapor. Now, that's not necessarily clouds. Clouds also play a role. Clouds are, you know, condensation of water. Water vapor is just simply like free H2O in the atmosphere, of which there's a lot. Okay, it's also in the oceans. So, you know, it's the evaporation of water out of the oceans. The, our atmosphere has a lot of HO, hydro, of water in it. Water vapor is, is an important um, greenhouse gas effect. Carbon dioxide is one one thousandth of one percent of the atmosphere. And its effect as a greenhouse gas is almost unmeasurable. It's so small. We've had ice ages with so if you if you had to pretend there was a basketball court and that was the atmosphere. The hydrocarbon, the CO2 would occupy like one square inch of that basketball court. It'd be like a grain of sand. Okay. I just want to get that into some grain visual of sand. thing. A tiny. grain of sand, tiny. Yeah. And of course, well, yeah, it has an effect, but 70% of the picture we're drawing is water vapor. Now, why are we going to concentrate on this, this little grain of sand and forget about the 70% of the world? Well, because hydrocarbon fuels don't emit water vapor. So we can't demonize it. My God. Okay. And um, what the Germans found out was that the earth internally has the right elements. Has It has enough hydrogen. It's got enough carbon. It's got, it's got uh, iron. And iron oxide is a good ca catalyst. It's got the temperature. It's got the heat. So the mantle of the earth is where hydrocarbons are formed. Now, this was, again, a very radical idea 
again, our hydrocarbon, our, our petrogeologists don't believe it even today. But the point is, they still think it's formed in sedimentary rock. Now, I point out, I mentioned the second law of thermodynamics, which is basically entropy, which means when you die, our bodies decompose. They go back to the constituent chemicals. The Bible says, from dust into dust. Sure. Say from dust into oil. When you know you bury somebody, you don't put a rubber lining in the casket because Aunt Matilda is going to turn into oil. It doesn't <laughs> happen. Okay, Aunt Matilda is going to become dust. If she's lucky, you're going to have a little bit of skeleton left. Even over time, that'll go. Fossils are not the animal; they're usually silica. Yeah, it's the animal structure, and so therefore, uh, the idea that the abundance of oil we have is from dying organic material, um, especially given the evidence we have. Thomas Gold, who was a very famous uh, scientist at Cornell, talked, wrote a book called the, the Deep Hot Biosphere. What he realized was in the bottoms of the oceans, which are so dense there's no light down there. There are these hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon chimneys. There's big chimneys coming at the bottom of the oceans, and they exude hydrocarbons. You know, methane, a whole bunch of hydrocarbons are coming out of these. And the plants and animals down at that level live on the hydrocarbon. They don't live in photosynthesis. Now, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, which is very reputable, went down to these Woods Hole, they went down to these hydrotherms and they sampled the hydrocarbons. There were an article in Science and said these hydrocarbons are produced by the Fisher Trops process. So we do have scientific evidence that Fisher Trops chemistry is active in the mantle of the earth producing hydrocarbons today. And no one knows this because it's the type of science that they don't want to teach in the schools. What do you mean? Who's they that don't want to teach? I mean, I, okay. I, you're, you're going up against a whole established... Petrogeologists. Petrogeologists. Yeah. I write about them. I actually yeah. bought a whole shelf full of you know, hydrocarbon chemistry books. And they all start out by saying that oil and natural gas and coal are fossil fuel because they are made from organic material. It's an organic material that died in the swamp or died in the right condition. Which was a theory that somebody put forward in the 19th century. It goes, yeah, it actually goes back to about some 18, 1800. Somebody just, ago. somebody just, some guy, some British, some English so guy in a laboratory Russian came up with this idea. Russian, okay. Russian, Russian guy. Russian. Okay. Around the time of Humboldt. If you know about Humboldt, Humboldt was one of these natural, you know, natural history guys, and they were speculating about how oil was formed. They said it came from dying organic material. Now, Med, Medlev, who did the atomic chart, was also a, you know, he, he did the atomic, uh, the atomic chart we use today in chemistry was from Mendeleev. Now, he was in the 1850s. He said that oil, natural gas, coal were hydrocarbons and they did not come from dying material. He actually worked in the uh, and he actually worked in the energy industry in the 1850s. Now he he this is the guy who developed the atomic chart. I suspect he knew something about chemistry and atomic structures. And he understood, as I do, that you know you don't need a living thing to produce living molecules that then produce oil. But why are the petrol? Well, this you know the book. By the way, this is the Bill Walton show, and I'm here with. Uh, Dr. Jerome Corsi, and he's written a wonderful book. That's it's a comp book. it's a complex book, but it's totally worth it. The truth about energy, global warming, and climate change, exposing climate lies in an age of disinformation. Uh, it it stay with us on the show and listen to this and go to his book because if you want to know the truth, this is the place. This is the place to start. Now, there's this Jerry. There's this. Thomas Kuhn wrote this book called The Structure of Science Revolu Scientific right. Revolutions, which I'm sure you know. Oh, yes, and he talked it. about the new big ideas that came along. And I thought it was, I don't remember the whole detail of it, but the gist was this. The scientific establishment holds a, holds a, a, a conventional point of view. And then there's another idea that comes up. And that new idea comes up with some young guy. Let's call him Einstein. Let's call him Jerry Corsi. Uh, but anyway, they come up with this idea and the establishment just absolutely rejects it. And the only way that new idea gets accepted 
is the old scientists die. <laughs> well, and, and also, <laughs> and, you, because, and so you got a generational change before but, you can't change minds. You just have to have new minds that are receptive. Thomas Kuhn said basically in, is that what happens is you come up with a scientific theory, like that the um, sun revolves around the earth rather than the earth revolving around the sun. And then you start making observations and your data doesn't fit the old theory. Right. So the old theory is, is, right. is leaky. Somebody comes up with a new theory that fits the data better. Now, I'm just telling you, you've got scientific confirmation the mantle of the earth is producing hydrocarbon fuels through these fisher trops equations the Germans came up with. Now, that's new data that says the fossil fuel theory is obsolete because fossil fuel theory can't explain how dead organic material got into the mantle of the earth. And if they tried to, they're not going to be able to have enough dinosaurs down there to make oil. So, so we're not burning those poor little dinosaurs no. that from oh god. <laughs> tell it, tell AOC that. Well, <laughs> I mean, well, look, when I grew up as a kid, a... when I grew up as a kid in the fifties, they had Dino the dinosaur who was sure, the yeah, I was there. oil. I was there, okay, and every, all the kids had Dino the dinosaur little toys. Okay, <laughs> well, even as a kid, I thought that was nonsense. Yeah. How many dinosaurs did it take to make a barrel of oil? It was a ridiculous idea. You can't boil a dinosaur down to oil. Now, the problem is that that idea stuck. Okay. And then it again is part of the idea that there's, because these creatures died, the carbon dioxide died with them. Okay, and now we're releasing dead carbon dioxide, which is also nonsense because there's carbon dioxide is not one of the main constituents of decomposed material. Yeah. I mean, you know, decomposed material goes back into the original chemicals. The Bible does not say, you know, dust into oil, <laughs> dust into coal, or dust into natural gas. Right. Yeah. So, so how happen. do we... We've got it. We're, you're going to come back. We got to dig into this some more. And I, I promised you I'd read a couple of your tougher chapters and I didn't get to them. I'm going to get to them. We're going to go dive into those. But how do we, in, in, the, in the 10, 15 minutes we've got left, how do we turn this into an elevator pitch to change minds? Because if we don't change minds, we're, we're running like lemmings off a cliff. Well, we are. In fact, we are. And uh, the, I guess I would, the, the main concept in the book there's two main concepts in the book number one is that the earth's climate and weather patterns are extremely complex they are impacted by the intensity of the sun which varies sometimes the sun burns hot sometimes it's in a minimum that affects earth's temperature uh, earth's temperature is affected by the amount of cosmic rays that hit us from interstellar material because cosmic rays produce clouds they have the right physics to interact and produce clouds well the clouds are a negative feedback clouds block the sun and make the earth cooler so cosmic rays enter in then the other factors that are extremely important as i said water vapor in the atmosphere but the ocean currents you know, the ocean currents have a major effect on climatic conditions. So right now, for instance, and this is December of 2022, and again, the, the Arctic vortex, which is a wind pattern, because of the ocean currents, this complex interaction has dipped down into North America and into Europe. So for a while, late December, early January, it can be reasonably predicted that we're going to have in the middle of the United States, extending up into New England, because it'll sweep that way, we'll have blizzards and very, very cold weather. And it will also be hitting in Europe. Now, that's a complex pattern. So number one concept is no single variable, like carbon dioxide, has the ability to drive Earth's weather or temperature. It doesn't. And these kind of you know, cataclysmic, we have tornadoes, we have hurricanes. They're a natural function of the Earth's 
weather. Weather is, it, weather is, it, it's raining today. You know, it's snowing today. Climate is patterns of weather. Okay, so patterns of weather can be an ice age. Ice ages are not caused by a little bit more, a little bit less carbon dioxide. They're caused by the Earth's pattern around the sun. And when it gets more elliptical, we have an ice age, more distant from the sun. And there's mathematics that demonstrate that. So number one is the Earth's it, weather and climate are extremely complex. And no one variable like carbon dioxide determines what's going to happen. Number two, the Earth distributes heat. So we get a lot of heat on the equator. The Earth wants to move that heat to the poles and to the upper atmosphere. This is a natural process. Not because we're humans here. The Earth is not adjusting for us. There have been five extinctions before humans got here. And you know we're just the latest creatures walking around the surface of the Earth as far as the Earth is concerned. There have been others here before. So that's number one point, how complex this is. Number two, the mathematics. Now, I just got some fairly deep mathematics in the book. I try to make it simple, but I'll make this very easy, I think, I hope. The Earth's climate is nonlinear. Now, linear equation means if you put the variables in, you know, you put two and two, these variables of four will come out. And you put four and four and eight will come out. Put eight and eight and 16 will come out. In nonlinear equation, you can put a two and two and you might get seven because there's other factors internal in the equation which manipulate the variables so it doesn't always produce the same result. In mm -hmm. fact, it's chaotic. The Earth's, it's chaos. So no mathematical model can ever capture the complexity of how the Earth operates. Um, now, these concepts lose people pretty quickly, and you have to think about them. But imagine it this way. The IPCC wants to tell you that if we burn hydrocarbon fuels, and this is a greenhouse gas, it's going to heat up the earth. Burn twice as much, it'll heat up the earth twice as much. Okay? A fundamental logical fallacy, which is post hoc, propter hoc. In other words, just because something happened afterwards doesn't mean it's because of. And I illustrate that by saying... You know, my mother says to me, you failed your test today, and it was because you didn't eat your breakfast. No, I failed my test today because I didn't study. <laughs> I didn't go to the class. I didn't know what this whole course was about. They gave me the test. I didn't know what they're talking about. That's why I failed, mother. It didn't have anything <laughs> to do. Now, I didn't eat breakfast. But if I ate breakfast, I'd still fail the class. So if we produce more carbon dioxide because of burning hydrocarbon fuels, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to heat up the atmosphere that much more. Because it's a nonlinear equation, and it's very complex, and it may not behave in a linear fashion. It may not produce the results you think it's going to produce. Well, I keep coming back to that grain of sand in the corner of my gym floor. That I mean, yeah. how would even that's quite, going to quite rippling its size have anything to do with the global that grain of sand uh, in your in your corner of your if your living room is going to determine how your marriage is going today? I don't think so. <laughs> They have to do how you treat your wife. That might have something to do with it. But that grain of sand probably doesn't have anything to do with how your wife is feeling. Well, how, I've got so many questions for you, but I. But how did how does how do high IQ people in business and government and you know throughout the West seem to have agreed that uh, CO two is the villain and we need to and and CO two is produced by hydrocarbons and, high, and burning those. And therefore, we need to shut down uh, the Western economy with- uh, Kill ourselves because, in order to save the planet. Yeah. So so why do we, who are the, I mean, we, we can make a whole argument about the global elites and the global elites don't think it'll affect them because they'll have plenty yeah. left for them and it the rest of us itself. will suffer. But without without getting into the global elite question, how to, how to, you know, sort of average smart people think this blindingly well, wrong thing is true. There's there's a couple of answers to that. Number one, the only thing green in the climate debate is money. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, and there's a lot of money to be made doing conversion to hydrocarbon, away from hydrocarbons to do wind and solar. And 
Obama spent billions, Biden's spending billions again. And when it doesn't work, they'll spend billion more because the fact that it doesn't work doesn't prove to them it won't work. It's like communism. It just, just proves more of it. Yeah, do yeah. more of it. We'll, we'll get it right. We just didn't do it right. We'll do it right this time. Well, no matter how many times they do it, they're just going to spend, but those billions are gone and nobody went to jail. So it's a great way to get billions of dollars. Number two, understanding climate requires, and I'm, I, you know, I've tried in my book to make it easy. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have to think and read it. In fact, I met with my publisher yesterday, and we kind of decided to break this book into about three and let you have people read bites of it because it's, it's you know, there's so much in here. But the point well, is... As, a, as, a, as an earnest reader myself, yeah, I agree with that. I would break yeah, it into right. smaller chunks. Good idea. You can sell more well, books. It's good. So I, you know, make it a cereal. <laughs> I, I publish here. If that's what he wants, I'm going to do it. He's very smart. <laughs> But the point is, um, look, the it, it's easy to fall into a mistaken idea. And the Malthusians telling us we're all going to die. You know, chicken little, the sky is falling. It's easy to believe a scare. I mean, I started out the book with Charles uh, McKay, who wrote this book, you know, the madness of crowds and uh, about extraordinary, popular. extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds. It's it's a classic. Everybody should own that. And he uh, demonstrated, for instance, going back to the 1600s or whatever in Holland, they thought tulip bulbs, which produced these different various colors of tulips were. So everybody invested in the tulip bulbs. When the craze died, about all they could do is eat the tulip bulbs because they were worthless. <laughs> People lost fortunes. Well, let's, you know, let's go... Let's everybody leave their families. We'll march off to the Crusades. We'll get indulgences from the Catholic Church, and we'll kill the Muslims, and we'll take over the Holy Land. Okay, so everybody rocks and walks out of Europe. They, oh, let's kill the witches because they're you know, be, they're now possessed by the demons, and so therefore we got to burn them at the stake. So we burn a lot of women at the stake, and then so at some point or other, people say, "Hey, this, is, this isn't working. It's a bad idea. They were never possessed." You know, what are we going to do with the Holy Land once we possess it? You know, the other people living there, they've been living there for a long time. What do you do with them? It was not a very well thought out idea. But not thought out ideas that scare people or motivate them are very appealing to the human psychology. And you can put it in very simple terms, like Himmler saying, tell a big lie and tell it often eugenics you got to kill the jews well that's a very bad idea you know first of all it's inherently wrong to commit suicide i mean it's horrible it's horrific but, but here's i want to dig into something that you just okay you tell the big lie himmler was an agent of that he didn't believe it yeah. but he knew it was Probably a big lie sure. my question is larry fink Larry Fink runs BlackRock. Larry Fink is a big brain. You know, he's good at he's a Money. good bond trader. Uh, Money. How much is he going to make? Well, then you're saying this is self-interested. It's not. He doesn't really believe this I don't nonsense think... about climate change. Most... You're saying it's a self-interested move, not based on on the, on any science, but what will give him more money and power. Most of the people I know working in the oil industry couldn't care less about dinosaurs. They're finding oil deep in the ocean. They're finding oil at great depths because we got the technology to go down there. They know how to take shale and make it into oil. It's another hydrocarbon. They know how to convert it. They, you talk to them about, they, say, they don't care about dinosaurs. They care about producing oil. And they're going to go get it where they can get it, where the technology takes it to them. And the they, you know, resource economist, Julian Simon, who I read about in the book, was not a... He was not a Malthusian, so that the only ultimate resource is human intelligence and human ingenuity. Right, right. And that we need to preserve the gene pools, that we have, you know, genius is rare. We have more people, we'll have more geniuses. You know, Julian Simon used to say in the Holocaust, how many Mozarts did we kill? How many Beethovens did we kill? How many Einsteins did we kill? And, and that, those genetic pools are gone. You know, what that's another tragedy 
of these genocides, not just the human insanity of killing millions of people, which is a madness, but the idea also that you are, are it's, it's self-defeating, it's suicidal. You're, you're destroying some of the gene pools you want to be preserving. And yet eugenics, you know, there's bad genes, we've got to get rid of these people, they're evil, you demonize Jews, very popular idea. The, the German people were highly, highly educated and they became Nazis. They went for this, the racial ideology. You know, the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, not the most beautiful institution on the face of the earth, had gone through a reformation, ran the Inquisition, yeah. and ran the Crusades. You know, so again, human, a bad idea that scares people with a simplistic concept is very powerful to human psychology. Because to refute it requires the knowledge of understanding the phenomenon you're talking about. So if we want to talk about witches, maybe we have to understand abnormal psychology, which even today is yet being understood. It's a very complex area of, psych of, of science. And to understand, you know, this book got praised by some of the top scientists. You see the the, the blurbs at the beginning of the book. And the top scientists basically acknowledge that um, the public is totally unaware of the physics or the chemistry of how climate works. We can't predict weather reliably over six months. How can we say that we're going to produce this much hydrocarbon and we're going to destroy the earth? Again, it's a complete folly it, it 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 stands out with a blaring red light to say this is a hoax well it's, my, a folly. it's madness my 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 assumption here is that this didn't get reviewed by the new york times or the washington no. post or, they left or, us any the, or any of the any of the mainstream uh um, they ignore it they want yeah. to, their basic so this is once again the, the ideas like this they're not letting they're being they're being tucked into a corner and not 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 reported or covered. But yet the book is there. See, I, I think the book will be read more after yeah. I'm dead. These are the kinds of books. I, by the way, I'm writing a trilogy. Okay. The second book on the neo-Marxism. I think I do not. I did not. I wrote this book knowing if I could get the visibility, I could make it a number one book. But no, well, I'm, I'm going to help totally you do totally that. But we may. Well, I, we, I'm greatly we, appreciative, Bill. I'm we we may have to come back and talk a lot more because sure. you know, we, we're covering the whole. And I guess we've got to wrap this up. I hate it. I could sit here and do this all day long. I got to. I got to talk to Joe Rogan to see if he's got a franchise <laughs> on three-hour shows. I mean, we, well, you know, get Joe. To, I'll be happy to talk <laughs> with. Him. Okay. Well, we'll we'll come back and get at this some more. So, but anyway, Bill, I'm delighted for talking with you, and thank you for the show. Well, well, for for those of you that are listening and instead of watching, and there are a lot of you, um, the book is The Truth About Energy, Global Warming, and Climate Change, Exposing Climate Lies in an Age of Disinformation. It's on Amazon. It's in Kindle. It's in paperback. Um, highly recommended. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised Jeff Bezos lets it lets it stay up there. But while it is there, uh, go buy it's, it. It, 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 it. This book is going to sell for a long time. Good. It's, it'll be selling for it'll catch on but it's going to take time for people to penetrate these ideas the hoax and as the hoax collapses and as you see what happens to europe um in trying to not exist when russian gas you're going to realize that people are going to be searching for the truth and it's, they'll find it, it it's effective. going to be a cold dark winter in europe yeah and yes uh, and people perhaps, are going to die perhaps part of the united states so anyway, thanks. Thanks you all for joining. And uh, again, this has been the Bill Walton show and you can find us on Substack and uh, YouTube and Rumble and all the major podcast platforms. And please subscribe on your favorite platform. Uh, we will uh, we will. And also get, if you get on if to join on our website, we'd appreciate your comments, uh, which you can give us on all the platforms as well. We take them to heart and uh, think about future conversations based on what you tell us you'd like to hear. So anyway, thanks for joining and uh, we'll be back quite soon. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? 
click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read every one and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining. 